1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 through 22. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show you which of you have God's approval. So then, when you come together, is it not the Lord's Supper you eat? Oh, sorry, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. This uh, introduces a new section on the Lord's Supper. Um, and this will continue uh, all the way to the end of the chapter. And this is just the introductory paragraph of this. And it really highlights for us what the issue is. So Paul opens up with this statement in verse 17. In the following directives, so in what's about to come ahead, and this is regarding the Lord's Supper. And uh, that's the Lord's Supper specifically, but in general, it's about worship. It's about when the body gathers together for worship. And what's important to remember is that the Corinthian is a collect the Corinthian church is a collection of house churches. So everything we read of may not be universal for every house church, but it's true enough of enough houses that Paul has to address the issue um, to the whole church. So this stands in contrast to verse two where Paul says, I praise you for remembering me in all of the um, traditions I have handed down to you. But now he says, I have no praise for you. And we can say, why, Paul? Why aren't you happy? And Paul will say, for your meetings do more harm than good. Again, meetings here particularly, we're looking at the Lord's Supper, which is, should be an edifying practice, but instead of being edifying, which would be good to build up the body, it does harm. All right, so that first section really gives us the issue. What's going on? And then Paul continues in the first place. So we know we're starting off this new thought. I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. By the way, first place, this is going to refer to, again, Lord's Supper, because there's going to be issues all the way through the end of chapter 14 regarding worship. But he says, I hear, and this is similar to the phrase that he's used to elsewhere to talk about it's been reported to me, right? I hear that when you come together, so meetings, boom, that, that concept of meetings is getting unpacked here. So it's not just any meetings, but when you come together as a church, and that's how we know this is like a worship service. This is fellowship. When this happens, boom, there are divisions among you. So you should see a relationship, right? When you come together, divisions show up among you. Again, this is in the context of a house church. So even when there's just 30 people gathering together, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. It's a really interesting phrase. It means that whatever was said to Paul seems awful. And he's saying, to some extent, I believe the awful report, which means that the report is, is more awful than what he's bringing up here. And then he, he gives a really interesting uh, kind of little caveat to this. So this next section here, we could call that the report, right? He says, no doubt there have to be differences among you. This phrase, have to be, is a little weak, I think, in English. In the Greek, it's, it's very much that it's a necessity. It is, nece it is necessary that there are differences among you. Just like there are, and this, sorry, the reason that this is important is that this also this word differences is the same word for divisions up here. So I don't, I don't, again, I don't know why they translate it differences. But it, no doubt there must be divisions among you. And that is a really interesting statement. 
Why? Why would there have to be divisions among us? Here's the answer. That word two tells us here, we're getting our answer. To show which of you have God's approval. So God's approval uh, is a really interesting statement. We think of, um, I think it's first Timothy, might be second Timothy, where God talks about God's approved workmen are not ashamed, right? Uh, if you were an Awana, that's, that's a big verse that you had to memorize, right? And so uh, there are differences to show who has God's approval. That is, God's true people will show themselves to be different. Um, so not all division is bad. Some division is necessary, particularly division from true believers and false believers. And so like as a trial comes to a church, false believers will fall away. True believers will stick around. And so there must be some divisions among you. But it shouldn't be in this context of when you come together as a church. So then, and so like in this next section, we kind of get a acceptable division. And then we get to their issue in this next part. So then the kind of just, it's a connecting statement. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat for... When you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and the other gets drunk. And so Paul really gets specific here about the issue. Specific issue. So up here, this first one, I have no praise for you, right? He's going to address worship. Uh, and specifically here, but directives, you know, worship for Sunday morning what's going on with them. But down here in verse 20, we get real particular. We know that we're now addressing the Lord's Supper. So the connecting word, when you come together, that's a condition, which we've already seen. There are divisions among you. And now here we talk about the Lord's Supper. So we know that the division is linked to the Lord's Supper. Okay, there is a relationship. There's a link there. It is not the Lord's Supper you eat. Now that would be an alarming word because that's what they did every time they gathered. We're gathering to eat the Lord's Supper. What do you mean it's not the Lord's Supper, right? That's a, that's a really strange thing to say again. And Paul, again, provides the answer. Four, here's, he's going to qualify his statement. When you are eating... All right, that's, again, a condition. In that moment of being together and eating, so that's condition one, condition two, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Go ahead with your own private suppers. This is a really interesting picture. So we kind of have a potluck scenario. But instead of everyone sharing the food, the people are bringing just their own dinner. So it's not really a potluck. It's just a BYO food scenario. Bring your own food. Not very church-like. But there are some people in the church who don't have the money to provide supper for themselves every day, right? We, we don't even think about, what? I'm not going to eat dinner every day? There were people who regularly didn't have food for dinner. They were poor. As a result, one person remains hungry, which would have been the person who doesn't have enough money for their own private supper, and another gets drunk. So the other person who brought us private supper brought enough wine and bread to actually get drunk, right? The division here is along the lines of money. That's, that's the big separating piece. Paul asks the question, now beginning in verse 22, don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? And earlier when I said, you know, the issue, this issue is about money. This is about the poor and the rich. Those who have nothing tell us, tells us that this is between the, the poor and the rich. And it's not even that rich, right? It's just rich enough to have dinner. But there are people who have nothing. And when they come for the Lord's Supper, rather than being 
built up and experiencing good, they experience harm, right? Because the poor have been humiliated. If the Lord's on the day of the Lord's Supper, because they can't bring their own bread and wine, they don't have any way to partake. And they're humiliated on the day that they're supposed to be having fellowship with one another and with the Lord. And Paul has already outlined that fellowship principle in chapter 10. So he says, don't you have your own homes to eat or drink in? Here is really the solution to this issue, right? Uh, if you don't, it, you don't have to eat and drink your whole dinner here. You could you could do less. Just eat and drink at home so that you're you're full there. And as you come, you know, then you're going to be willing to share your bread and to share your wine. Um, at a, at a much more basic level, obviously the church should be sharing all of their food. We live in a time and place, thankfully, where food abounds for us. Um, and so this is a difficult thing for us to understand to get our minds around not sharing or not having enough food or or drink for, for the Lord's Supper. But food didn't abound for them. It wasn't as easy. It, it was more sacrificial. And so it's easy to put ourselves first. It was easy for them to put themselves first. And so Paul paints this in an incredible contrast. Or, or so here's option one, or do you despise the church of God? And, and that really gets to the heart here. That to, to eat your fill while your brother or sister goes hungry is an act of hate for those who have nothing. And so Paul says, what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this manner. And so this last piece is really the rebuke. Now Paul will go on to correct their um, dealings with the Lord's Supper, and we'll even see ahead in the verses that, that some have fallen asleep, they've died because of this. But, but for this one piece here, we, we can see what happens when we put ourselves first. Whoops. Um, sorry. I'm, there we go. When we put ourselves first in corporate worship. Corporate worship. This can show up in so many, many ways. Obviously, it can show up in money. I don't want to go to church with poor people. It can show up in politics. I don't want to go to church with Democrats or Republicans. It can show up with masks. I don't want to go to people with church with people who don't wear masks the way I do. I don't want to go uh, to church with people uh, who aren't the same race as me or culture or who like the same music, worship music, songs. There are so many ways in which we can do exactly this. So division in the body and do more harm than good. And it's whenever we put ourselves first. So what's interesting about this is, you know, there's not any real command here in these. And so we kind of have to supply. What is the command? What are we supposed to be doing? And if there was anything, it would this be, it would be uh, put others before yourself. That's how you worship God and honor your brother and sister in Christ. If you want more on that, go check out Philippians 2, 5 through 11. And you can see what it looks like to put others before ourselves. That, brothers and sisters, is true worship that edifies the body.